We are talking about the patriarch Abram, whose name later was changed to Abraham. And it's part of our series on Foundations Revisited. And last week we talked about giving to God first, which Abraham did back in Genesis chapter 14. And this is part two of that series, which goes into the New Testament and examines uh, things like the tithe or the tenth and what's biblical, what's not biblical from Genesis 14 and various other passages. And it's great, a good crowd showed up. Usually when you announce the week before you're going to talk about giving, you know, it's hard to tell what you're going to get, but this is a no pressure place. The concept of a creation responsible to a creator is the only solid foundation for personal, national, global health and security in our world, and that includes finances, includes how our government spends money, how world governments spend money, how we spend uh, our money, how we give back uh, to God in, in service for the great things he's done for us. And so we entitled it Giving to God First, Part 2, and we want to pick it up in the book of Hebrews because it talks about Melchizedek there. We talked about a lot of this. If you were not here last week, you can get uh, the CD or it's posted on the, uh, uh, the video on our website. But Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1, it says, This Melchizedek was king of Salem. Remember we said Melchizedek um, was a priest of God most high? He met Abraham, returning from the defeat of the kings, and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth, that's that word tithe, of everything. First, the name Abraham means king of righteousness. Um, Melech is king. Melchizedek, um, the ending part of that is righteousness. Then also, king of Salem, Salim, means king of peace. His genealogy without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever, in contrast to the Levitical priest, which was a temporary thing uh, as long as the priest lived. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. When um, uh, Abraham overtook and defeated and rescued Lot uh, and defeated the uh, uh, king of uh, Sodom, he, uh, he gave um, a tenth to uh, God, or to Melchizedek, as a priest, as a representative of God. Continue in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8. In one case, the tenth is collected by people who die. That's it. Uh, Levitical priests uh, from the Old Testament system. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living, that is, this eternal Melchizedek, one might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, he's the Levitical priest that would, uh, and his lineage, would collect the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. So we want to talk about the meaning and the use of the tithe, or the term tithe, or tenth, in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 14, it's mentioned there, verse 20. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything or a tithe of everything. Bible knowledge commentary, Melchizedek is the only person whom Abraham recognized as his spiritual superior. Abraham accepted blessing from him, and Abraham paid him a tenth, a tithe, of all he had. Abraham did this deliberately in full awareness of what he was doing. It shows how unthreatened and humble Abram was even after a victory. And then we look at the wealth and the fairness, the balance of Abram. Again, in Genesis chapter 14, down to verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, who had defeated, With raised hand I have sworn an oath to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will except nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, 
so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich, so that the king of Sodom couldn't take the credit. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me, to Anna, Eshcol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. So he's fair, he's compensating those who went into battle with him, but he's taking nothing for himself. Again, the Bible Knowledge Commentary on Genesis 14, 17. The king of Salem met Abram. The king of Salem blessed Abram. The king of Sodom offered Abram a deal. You see the contrast there? The fact that the offer from the king of Sodom came after Melchizedek's blessing helped Abram keep things in perspective. He knew that Melchizedek had blessed him. He knew that he had, could count on the promise of God, and so he didn't need to depend on the king of Sodom uh, for whatever uh, wealth or riches he needed. Now here's the question. If the New Testament doesn't talk about the tithe very much, if it's not a tithe or a tenth, then what is it? There are only two uses of tithe in the New Testament. And they are both pointing back to the Old Testament practices of the law. They don't point to the New Testament at all. They don't point to the time of Christianity or the age of Christ. They point back as a review of what the Levitical law would do. They are in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It says, Jesus is talking and he says, What do you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? Uh, he, he railed on the scribes and Pharisees most, uh, calling them hypocrites. For you tithe, you give a tenth of mint and dill and cumin. Now, how far, how small is that? So they are to the nth degree tithing, sorting out their seeds. Um, and, and Jesus says, it's just hypocritical. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faithfulness, taking care of your parents, um, being fair and being right in your business practices. They, they were cheating everybody. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You can still sort out your seeds if you want, but that's not the important issue. Now, it's interesting because if you have an NIV Bible, which we have in our pews, and if you look up Matthew chapter 23, verse 23, you're going to say, Terry, there's no tithe in there. And you're right. The word tithe isn't in there. Uh, I don't even think the word tenth is in there. Uh, but it's as translated in the American Standard Version and the ESV, but not in the NIV because they rightly chose to not put it in. Now, the ASV was done in uh, the 1890s, 1901 translation, and it is a almost literal, almost literal translation of the New Testament Greek. In fact, when we were studying for Greek exams, we had to sight translate the Book of Romans in grad school. So they could go to any place in Romans that they wanted. Well, you know how we did it? We get the Greek New Testament, lay it on the side of the ASV, and we follow along the practice to see how to translate all of this so that when we got there for the test and we had to do site translation, we were able to do it. It is a very wooden, very literal um, uh, uh, translation. And it's, it's very good, but it's, it's a lot like the King James. It's a lot of these and thous and those. And, it's a little hard to read. The English is awkward. The other place is in Luke chapter 11, verse 42, and it's a parallel passage. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And again, it's the same thing. Uh, it's in the ASV, it's uh, in the ESV, but it's not in the uh, New International Version translation. So now I want to give you some things about Jesus. Now that's what Matthew and Luke quoted Jesus as. But Jesus and the principles of giving and receiving. And it comes from an odd place. 
Nowhere in the New Testament, nowhere in the writings of Jesus do we find this passage. We find it in the book of Acts with the writer Luke. And it's interesting because there's never a quote from Jesus uh, except for what Luke refers to. Acts chapter 20, verse 35. In everything I did, the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, Apostle Paul is writing, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Look in the Gospels, you'll never find that. It is more blessed to give than receive. But do you know why it's legitimate? It was such a common saying of Jesus that every one of the disciples knew it. And the Apostle Paul comes here and Luke records it and he says the principle that Jesus operated on is that you're going to be happier, you're going to be more blessed if you give rather than always looking to receive. There's nothing wrong with receiving at certain times in our lives, but he says it's more blessed to give than to receive because it makes life work. It's a, it's a foundation for life. If you think about when you do something kind for someone, when you give someone to something, um, and you don't give it grudgingly, you know that it's helping them out. Think about how you feel. Think about the, the difference it makes in uh, your soul and your, and your spirit. And so that's why that principle is true. Then Jesus talked about another situation. Now again, these are, this is still in the context of the Old Testament. He's uh, going to the, uh, the treasury with the offering and he talks about G, uh, the uh, widow's might. In Mark chapter 12, verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Do you know Jesus is the only person who can legitimately do that? It's not your business to watch who's put money in the, the offering or in the treasury. But Jesus, because he's perfect righteousness and perfect in his judgment, he could sit there and, and he could pass uh, proper judgment on all of this. They put their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, and the implication is out of their abundance. This was nothing for them. They were rich. They just, you know, let's skim a little off the top, and we'll be okay, and we'll make it look like we're doing well. Verse 42, but a poor widow, Jesus said, came and put in two very small copper corn, coins, as we call the widow's might, worth only a few cents. So, if it's only a few cents, it might have been anywhere from one to four. Um, because then we'd be up to a nickel, wouldn't we? So, you do the math. It continues, calling his disciples to him in Mark 12, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others, all the other rich people. They all gave out of their wealth but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. So she was putting that in. She had nothing for tomorrow, and she was trusting God to take care of her tomorrow and the rest of the day. And Jesus said, she put in more than all the rich people who just, you know, oh, this is nothing. This is, you know, 20 bucks isn't going to cost me. Uh, anything, it's not going to be that difficult. I'll, I'll never miss it. I'll go, you know, spend that on a meal. It might be 40 bucks with the uh, economy, uh, the way it is. But, uh, but you know, you don't, you don't miss it if you're a rich person. And then Jesus talked about another principle, and it's the principle of secret giving. Again, we're still talking Old Testament concepts in the, in the book, uh, books of the Gospel, in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets. Could you imagine going to the back of the church, you're ready to put your offering in, and you pull out a trumpet, and da 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 And then you put your money in. That's, that's kind of what the hypocrites, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's pretty hard to do. If you have something in your left hand, your right hand knows what it is, because your brain knows, right? And he's, say, he's saying, this is so private, 
This is so extreme in a positive way that, you know, your left hand will fool your right hand. You won't know. So that your giving may be in secret. And here's the principle. Then your father who sees what is done in secret, he's got your back. He will reward you. Now you don't do it for a reward. You do it because it's the right thing to do to worship the living God. But if you do it that way, he notices. And nobody else has to notice. You know, we, we have built cathedrals in this country and in other countries. And we put plaques up. And everybody wants to have their name on a plaque to show that, you know, wow, look what, what I've given to this church, to this cathedral. Um, now we want to move to the Apostle Paul and his concept of generous giving. Now we're moving into the Christian era. We're out of the Gospels and we're looking at what it means to give as a Christian, not under the law, but under grace. For 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given to the Macedonian churches up there in Asia Minor. In the midst of a very severe trial, they were uh, having a shortage of fun, and fund and uh, famine and everything else. Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and then they gave beyond their ability. They trusted God, just like Abram trusted God. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. Can you imagine coming to the leadership and begging to give more money? Please, please, let me give more. Please. That's what they did. We want to give more. Okay? Now, you need to be reasonable about it. Don't, don't give away the whole farm, but trust God for what he wants you to do and how you determine in your heart what he wants. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first, and that's the key principle. If you haven't given yourself to God, you're not going to give him your money. It's just not going to happen. If you don't have a relationship with God that says, God's got my back, I am okay, I can give a certain portion that I determined before the Lord, it's nobody else's business, and it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And then you come up with arguments about what people, about people who have given in foreign countries and all kinds of things, and they've starved to death. And you know, and Jesus said, "The poor you'll always have with you." That that is one of the consequences of fallenness and brokenness in our culture. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first to all of all to the Lord. And then, by the will of God, also to us, they committed to other Christians. Giving should not be done grudgingly. There are a lot of people who, wow, I show up, the plate is passed, I better give something. They don't really think about it. I, I kind of like this thing where you can walk by the plate and you want to put in, you put in, you don't want to put in. That's, that's your business. That's between you and the Lord. So. I would rather have a way, and I don't know how to do it, that it could be just completely anonymous. Nobody would, nobody would watch you. Nobody would see you. Uh, it wouldn't, you know. But we, in our modern day, it's kind of hard to uh, to do that. You know, people who use checks or that sort of thing. But I got to tell you, um, no one, no one should ever discuss what you give. No one on our leadership board. I would be very, very upset if someone ever said anything, and uh, that probably has happened in the in in the past, uh, and I, I hate to see it happen under my watch. But I I don't want anybody else to that's between you and the Lord. Giving should not be grudgingly. Second Corinthians chapter nine and verse five. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance. And finish the arrangements. This is Macedonia, and they're going to finish the arrangements for the generous gift you have promised. So they promised it. It hadn't been delivered yet. 
Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. So we show up and say, you know, where's your money? Um, that's not right. And Paul wanted to avoid that. So uh, as a generous gift, not as a uh, done grudgingly. And generosity should be cheerful. In fact, it should be hilarious. You should be splitting your sides when you give, whether it's your time, your energy, your resources. Chapter 9 and verse 6, again in uh, Corinthians. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Why? Because there are eternal rewards at stake for our attitude, that we don't give grudgingly, that we give cheerfully, uh, that we, we sow a seed, uh, and whoever sows generously, you get a bountiful harvest. That's, that's the whole point. And you don't do it because you get a bountiful harvest. You do it because it's the right thing to do. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not what someone else told you. Not a pledge. I totally dislike pledges. The only time that I would ever use a pledge is with no name on it. If you were doing a building project and you just needed figures to, uh, for a budget to take to a bank. But I think pledges are an absolute waste of time. All it does is put guilt over people. So each of you should give before the Lord what you've decided in your heart, not what someone tells you, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That is the word hilarious. God loves a giver whose side is splitting because they have the joy of giving. I don't see many of you laughing when you're putting money in the offering plate. You just kind of file out. But that's really the principle there. Um, whenever you give, whenever you help someone, you're a cheerful giver, you're a hilarious giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly. There's, God's hands aren't tied. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What does that say? In some things, some of the time, having some of what you need, you'll abound in some good works. No. All things, all times, God knows. Having all that you need will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. This is an Old Testament quote. Their righteousness endures forever. And so when you give in that way, in a cheerful way, it fits a principle of your righteousness endures forever because of your service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just about money. It's about ministry. It's about every, everything that you do. It's about living your life before the Lord. Verse 9, chapter 9, verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. These are promises that are coming from the scriptures. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity, will result in thanksgiving to God because others will appreciate what you have done. Now I want to close with this because I don't know if you've ever thought about this. This is a um, pet theology of mine, but I think it's accurate. Giving is for all, but for some, the Bible calls it a special spiritual gift. You know, it's like the spiritual gift nobody wants because I got to give my money away. Uh, but that's not the way the person with the spiritual gift looks at it. I want to ask you a question. If you're a Christian, you may have the spiritual gift of teaching. Right? Does that mean you never have to teach another Christian? You never have to disciple another Christian? Not at all. You may not be a teacher in a classroom, you may not be a preacher or pastor teacher in a pulpit, but every Christian is responsible to teach others. Encouragement, that's a spiritual gift. Are you responsible to encourage everyone even if you don't have that spiritual gift? Yes, you are. 
Are you responsible to exercise faith even if you don't have the spiritual gift of faith? So do you see what I'm saying? There are things like teaching, encouragement, um, faith, um, administration, other things. You may not have that spiritual gift because the Holy Spirit gave those gifts to believers when you came to Christ and you need to develop that. However, you still are responsible for teaching, giving, faith, encouragement, all of those things. And I want you to see this from Romans chapter 12 where there's a list of spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12 verse 6. We have different gifts. My gifts are not your gifts. Ours are different. There may be some overlap. We have a number of pastor teachers in this congregation. We have people who have the gift of administration uh, in this congregation. According to the grace given to each of us, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, everybody's job is to serve, right? Then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. But even if you don't have the gift of teaching or the gift of serving, you still serve one another. If it is to encourage, spiritual gift, give encouragement. But you still have to encourage people, even if you don't think you have, um, you know, you might be the worst curmudgeon and say, I can't encourage anybody. Um, well, that's probably not your spiritual gift, but you still need to encourage other Christians in their walk with Christ. And then it says this, if it is giving, then give generously. So giving is for all in the congregation, but for some, it's a special spiritual gift. And you know how you know that spiritual gift? They take an unbelievable joy in giving quietly and making a difference in people's lives. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, everybody's supposed to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so you may not have the spiritual gift of giving, and that's not an excuse to say, well, I'm off the hook. I don't ever have to give again because let's let all the people who have the spiritual gift of giving take care of that. No, that's not the way it works. Because you cheat yourself. You forfeit a great joy that God has designed. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, thank you. The tithe, and we should never say we're going to collect the tithes and offerings because it's not biblical. We can say we're going to collect the offerings, but the tithe is something from the past. And now it's proportionally to give as you lead us, as we determine in our hearts before the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just give you thanks that this is a very, very faithful congregation. There are those here with the gift of giving and they use it. There are those here who don't have the gift of giving and they still give faithfully. And that's the way the body of Christ should work. So we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.